So thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Danny Buck. I'm hosting today as Will has just given a fantastic talk. We have, again, two great speakers today, Louise and Jamil. However, before we begin, there's a little housekeeping to do. Firstly, this seminar is being recorded and will be uploaded to YouTube sometime in the next week or so, just so you're aware. Um, can I ask that you remain muted until you get to ask uh, questions? Um, and finally, we will listen to, listen. Bo listen to both our speakers first and then have some questions. Um, again, you can either put your questions in the chat uh, during the, the, the uh, talks and we'll respond to them then. Or you can raise your digital hand and you can ask your questions via speech directly after our speakers. So our first our first. Our first Our speaker first today, speech. who's got the reverberation there? Can I, Alexander, can you mute, please? Oh, sorry. No problem, no problem. I just hear my own voice, I don't <laughs> like it. I'm um, not really sure how you do it on this. <laughs> it's always the way. It's to be to the side. And you've got the little, so you've got this in the middle of the screen. I, actually, it depends, because I don't know how it works with um, the the Teams app version, as opposed to the main one, but it should be an option that um, in the middle of your screen with camera and then uh, you button to the other side. Left. Yeah, that should be the bottom screen. I'll tell you what, I'll, uh, I'll come off because I'm, I'm not quite sure what I'm doing here. <laughs> oh, no, 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 it's fine. Don't worry. It'd be lovely to have you here. It's just, um, yeah, if you could. My computer's uh, sort of frozen a little bit, so it's a... sorry about this. No, no, no. no, no. It... Uh, the worst um, phone's in, it should be fine. Yeah. Oh, no, you got it, fine. Uh, sorry about that. Just kidding, uh, so, again, I'm very excited because our first speaker today is Louise Crawley, discussing the trials and tribulations of 18th century travel. Louise is in her second year of landscape history PhD at the UEA and is using 18th century travel writing to explore contemporary perceptions of landscapes as a way for us to reconsider our interpretations of designed landscapes and gardens. Oops. Right. Uh, I'm hoping I'm going to be able to share a PowerPoint with you. Um, if I can. <laughs> try. Bear with me one minute, as usual. <laughs> Can you see that, Danny? Is that all right? Or whomever? <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. That's, that's really good. Brilliant. Thank you, Danny. Uh, yeah, so as Danny says, uh, my thesis research looks at using unpublished domestic British travel writing from the long 18th century for its references to both designed landscapes and the wider landscape, uh, and the use of travel writing as a source for the landscape historian. Uh, I've put together a source base of extracts and transcripts of diaries and letters from around 30 different authors to explore how our current ideas about the contemporary popularity of certain types of landscape match up to the opinions recorded by unpublished domestic tourists. Much of the current historiography, particularly within garden history, has been shaped from the most famous published accounts, so it's been interesting to see how the unpublished matches up or in some cases goes against the grain. My recent research has surrounded the practicality of travel in Britain throughout the 18th century, as the most obvious impact of this is that accessibility affected where travellers went and therefore what they wrote. So I want to share with you some of these findings, mostly from the collection of archive material I've been building up as a bit of an experience of what it was like to travel by road in 18th century Britain. I should also introduce this character on my first slide here. This is Dr Syntax, a satirical caricature of a picturesque tourist illustrated by Thomas Rowlandson and accompanied by verse written by William Coombe. It was produced as a book in 1812 by which time the domestic traveller in search of the picturesque landscape, so that sort of landscape which meets the criteria of the aesthetic rules of the picturesque, uh, was a source of ridicule. And this, three, this theme is present in other publica publications of the time. So Jane Austen, for example, also enjoyed the odd dig at the picturesque tourist. Dr Syntax on his picturesque tour encounters a number of pitfalls of travel we shall come across here. So he provides quite good examples to illustrate some of my slides. 
It's fair to say that a traveller in Britain from around 1820 would have found their country's roadways unrecognisable back in 1700. This is the century in which road travel modernises and becomes far more feasible for a far wider variety of people than ever before. Road travel was embarked upon for leisure, even by elite women, something which must have seemed incomprehensible to most only a century earlier. The phenomenon of road travel for leisure has largely been put down to the advancement of the turnpike road network, which in turn, it has always been argued, was the result of economic growth and increased movement of materials and products across the country. Now, this is not the place to try and even explain or debate the opening up of the British economy, but basically the most important thing is that more traffic was on the move than ever before. And as such, Britain's roadways, particularly those linking London to other major urban areas, were deteriorating fast. Prior to 1700, little had changed for the majority of Britain's roads from the medieval period. Most were mud tracks churned up by livestock drovers, moving herds of cattle, sheep and geese across the country for centuries. Pack horse routes, one of the major means of transporting goods for several centuries by this point, were narrow and useless for travel by carriage. Pack horse bridges still survive in many rural parts of the country, usually made of stone and just wide enough for a single horse. Now, this example on the slide here is from the Peak District in Derbyshire. Transport of bulk material was eased somewhat by the establishment of the canal network through the latter years of the 18th century, but much still travelled by road. Some areas of the country were notoriously impassable. In the wheeled area of West Sussex, where I come from, there's a folktale warning to travellers in this period of the dangers of a muddy Sussex lane. A traveller making his way along a bank of muddy churned up lane spotted a hat sitting in the middle of the trackway. On stretching out to pick it up, he found beneath it the head of a local man, sunk right up to his eyebrows. Once he'd been pulled out, the man thanked the traveller and asked for help to haul out the horse he'd been riding. But he must be dead under all that mud, the traveller said. Oh no, he's alive right enough, the man answered. I could hear him munching away at something, probably the hay wain that sank along here last week. Mud was then one of Britain's biggest hindrances to travel, even into the 19th century on minor roads, as this rather charming illustration of ladies picking their way through the mud shows. And this is from a collection of Regency watercolours by Diane Sterling. Improvement to the road network was therefore the obvious solution. The turnpike road is probably something we've all heard of, where you pay a toll to use the stretch of road. Prior to the turnpikes, roads were something that was supposed to be maintained and paid for by the parishes that they ran through. And this seems somewhat unfair particularly for busy thoroughfares in and out of London, where the traffic and subsequent wear and tear of the roads was far greater than that which could have been created by the parishioners themselves. Turnpike Trust then placed the cost of upkeep upon those who used the road, with the theory that the busiest routes would be the mess maintained and the money they generated from tolls being used to maintain the roadways. And this uh, rather mind-boggling array of the various charges is from a later toll house which has been reconstructed at the Weald and Downer Museum in West Sussex. And you can see from the list there, it, it displays anything and everything which at one point must have passed the gate. There seems to have been a deep mistrust of the turnpike system, with accusations that those who ran the trust, namely local landowners, profited enormously whilst little was actually done to the roads. The turnpike stretches also benefited those such as the tourists I've been studying, who travelled infrequently and for leisure, whereas those who used the routeways more regularly would have felt out of pocket. We might assume that once a road became part of a turnpike trust with a toll levied on those that used it, that the routeway would be smooth, passable and improved. Certainly, if you were only to read the legal evidence of turnpike acts, it was seen by that around 1770, the majority of journeys could be conducted at least in part on turnpike roads. Uh, and this is a map of the turnpike network from the 1770s put in a series put together by Eric Pawson that seems to support this. There's also a fantastic online resource as well, which lists every single turnpike act in England for how long it lasted and the road length it covered, which again, if you read only this, would give the indication that journeys through these parts of England should be improved and efficient. Long distance journeys undertaken in the late 18th century often brought travellers to the forefront of these road improvements. In 1793, one traveller in the Malvern Hills commented, when the, great road is, when the great road is finished, this scene will draw all travellers this way. But until then, the execrable road sadly jolted our fine feelings about the place. If we look at the evidence presented in travel writing and travel diaries by those that actually use the roads, we see that the apparent improvement implied by turnpike status was not always the case. In trying to organise visitors to Rest Park in Bedfordshire in November 1773, Amabel York tried to reassure her guests of alternative routes, whilst admitting, 
I cannot much commend Luton, Downs and Barton Hills. However, considering in a journal kept a year earlier in 1772 by her husband, Alexander Hume Campbell, Lord Polworth, he felt compelled to note road very good over Luton Downs upon his journey to rest. And this suggests that the condition of the road was still dramatically affected by the seasons, even as late as the 1770s. And yet, this journey between the area around Luton towards Rest Park should have been conducted with relative ease, as a total 18 mile stretch of the road, now of which as much as the A6, had been under the authority of a turnpike trust since 1726. So if you were to go off this evidence alone, we might not expect that an established turnpike road with years of income to have maintained it to still be so greatly affected by the seasons that travellers were warned to avoid it altogether. In other areas, however, turnpikes were heralded as a great triumph, particularly over boggy countryside. A traveller between Scarborough and Hull in 1752 was relieved to find the road extremely good being turnpike, though the country on each side is a morass. But this is the value in added by consulting travel writing alongside the documentary evidence of legislation. Change in the law did not always result in change on the ground. The pace of improvement and connectivity in the road network is of interest to me because it enabled greater accessibility of travel right across the country, particularly to more remote upland areas. Greater accessibility to an area appears to be one of the main driving forces for the development of interest in different forms of landscape. North Wales, for example, really only experienced notable tourism for its landscape right at the end of the 18th century. Before this point, it had been widely considered impassable to all but the most intrepid travellers. Areas such as the Peak District in Derbyshire and the Midlands have been accessible for far longer, due in part to its proximity to the surrounding towns and later industrial cities. Thomas Hobbes visited the Peak District in the 1620s, and he wrote of its seven wonders, which remained popular tourist destinations right through the 18th century and beyond. Improved roads enabled the development of carriage technology so that travel could not only be made faster, but also far more comfortable and therefore more appealing for leisure. Typically, we would associate the 18th century with the stagecoach and the first reliable timetable services between major urban areas allowed for a far more predictable service. And all of this was of course enabled by the improved road services which can actually give you a time of departure. Here, oops, sorry. <laughs> here are a couple of adverts more local to us here in East Anglia show departures from Beckles, Norwich and Great Yarmouth from 1749. Once carriages had been improved to run fast on existing improved roads, the rest of the road network had to be improved as well, which allowed the carriages to actually complete their journeys. So the roads and the carriages sort of simultaneously drove the other to improve. Development of vehicles and carriages is a whole field of research in itself. And if you're particularly interested, there are museums dedicated to the subject, such as the National Trust's Carriage Collection at Arlington Court in Devon and the Mossman Collection at Stockwood in Luton. Alongside the stagecoach came the development of the fly or the flying machine, which really made the most of the improved roadways. Fly machines first appeared in the 1750s and were amongst the fastest means of road transport as they changed teams of horses continuously without rest. This is a picture here of the Abingdon machine, which first began flying in 1761. There was a certain level of discomfort implied in choosing to fly, but provided the traveller was willing to travel non-stop and sleep on the road, journey times between urban centres were very often halved. Running at night was only achievable as a result of the improved roadways and of a greater number of horses available on the routes as a general result of greater movement and traffic overall. To fly, it seems, would have been preferred for a purposeful journey rather than a leisurely one. Within the collection of travel writing I've been studying, Amabel York wrote to her mother, at Jemina, in 1774, teasing her for not wanting to miss a single fine or curious place whilst they travelled. And she therefore threatened her mother with, I think we may make you fly the first day. A hundred miles are as hard as ever the first horses can gallop. And perhaps that may abate your noble courage a little and you may wish for a little rest and quiet. So whilst the age of speed had well and truly arrived by the mid 18th century, this was not perhaps the aim of the leisurely travel for tourism. In any case, traveling in a carriage was not without danger. One traveler feared that the Hambleton Hills might be too breakneck at such speed. Carriage accidents were not uncommon. The landscape designer Humphrey Repton was injured in a carriage accident in 1811, which left him largely immobile for the rest of his life. With passengers sometimes perched precariously on the exterior of the stagecoach, they risked being flung off on stretches of uneven roads. The overcrowded coach was a popular material for cartoonists, 
and these are both by Thomas Rowlandson. So as the flying machine would be extremely uncomfortable and the stagecoach involved bending to another's timetable, as well as trying to cram yourself amongst the general public, for those who could afford it, their, their own carriage was the preferable option. And if not, they might choose to travel post. A post chaise was a package of privately hired carriage driver and or horses, which was available from an inn. And this is a later depiction of an inn yard in London from 1838, which shows these as busy changes of busy places of interchange. The post chaise could be ordered at any time from one inn and took their passengers along to the next stage, with the driver and chaise returning to their home inn afterwards. Post horses could also be ordered in the same way if the traveller had their own carriage. And this has been best described by Matt Dan Maudlin as sort of leapfrogging from place to place on the traveller's own terms, but it was a costly exercise. It's been estimated that travelling like this probably costs at least twice as much as travelling by stagecoach, but such was the status of the traveller for leisure that this appears to have been the preferred way to travel. Road travel therefore also required an expansive network of inns as well as improved roads. It's estimated that in around 1700, there were six to 7,000 inns in England, then more than 20,000 by 1800. This exponential increase can be directly tied to the expansion of the improved road network and ever increasing numbers of travellers. For a traveller embarking on a domestic tour, inns were described as a pretty tolerably tedious part of the experience. It's been suggested there was a sort of AA rating system in place in the later 18th century, with different inns categorised to appeal to different sections of English society. Principal inns are those intended to cater for elite travellers, so you didn't want to go to the wrong inn by accident. Even so, an inn was not exactly home from home. One female traveller wrote to her friend of her husband that if he does not like waiting for his dinner, to be sure he must not travel, for people at inns are seldom very exact. Though on the whole, I have no great cause to complain of them, at least not in England. In Scotland, however, where fewer travellers ventured until the very late 18th century, this might often be a very different story. One of the more prolific travellers in my study, Archdeacon John Eyre of Nottingham, found Scottish inns to be far less agreeable, from a shabby inn at Douglas Mill to a most terrible inn he had to suffer in Tindrum. None, however, were as bad as the inn at Logie, whose landlady presented us with some new cheese and beer bread, which required some resolution to taste and many days' hunger to eat. So this is a cartoon of Dr Syntax debating his bill with his landlady, and it captures a not uncommon occurrence. In a letter from 1784 within my study, one traveller was particularly put out to first be charged six shillings and sixpence to carry an overweight box, and then quoted an apparently extortionate 13 pence a week for his lodgings. To be sure this woman is out of her senses, he remarked. So whilst this might have been daylight robbery of one form, we cannot talk about travel in the 18th century without addressing the spectre of the highwaymen. Now you can imagine I was desperately disappointed to find that highwaymen were not encountered once in my archive collections. But this is definitely not to say that travellers were not at risk of burglary on Britain's roads. Horace Walpole supposedly encountered a highwayman in Twickenham in 1781, who relieved his female companion of her purse, but politely bid the travellers farewell after the robbery. Both loathsome horsemen and overcrowded coaches were most at risk of the highwayman, particularly as the latter was usually unguarded and laden with luggage. Coupled with poor road conditions, the traveller might be easy prey for a highwayman and the risk of being held up seemed to dramatically increase on the way to London. Further out in the country, you might be more at risk of the sort of highwaymen Dr Syntax has come across here, and these, these are usually described as footpads, sort of highwaymen without horses. A quick survey of the proceedings of the Old Bailey between the 17th and 19th centuries will show about 2,200 references to highway robbery, with the peak ending in around 1830. Increased road traffic undoubtedly seemed a lucrative target, and the risk of being sentenced to death if caught made the crime all the more audacious. About half the Old Bailey records for highway robbery actually carry a death sentence. The reality of travel in the 18th century for the elite person of leisure was that it took them outside of their normal existence. For women in particular, domestic travel was an increasingly rare opportunity to see their homeland up close and in person, and was one of the few ways in which they came into contact with the ordinary population. The divide between rich and poor was increasing dramatically in the 18th century, and the design landscapes of the elite show how the divide physically manifested. Encounters with ordinary people frequently made their way into travel writing, with often unflattering portrayals. Some, such as the Archdeacon Nottingham, reflected in horror of the living standards of the poor. In Scotland, he came across a wretched hut 
which he writes, he was tempted to look in, but the filth and stinks soon drew us back. Ordinary people in their lives were looked upon in curiosity as they were encountered, and we are reminded how far socially removed the traveller of leisure was from the rest of the population. The Earl of Orford was far less charitable than the Archdeacon, with his comments made on his travels around the Fens in 1774. He declared the area was equally remarkable for the ugliness of its inhabitants as for its landscape. So, once you've survived the mud, the terrible inns, the encounters with ordinary people, the threat of the highwaymen, there is but one thing left to do as a domestic traveller, and that is to share your trials and tribulations with others. One of the things which became increasingly apparent in my own research is that travel and travel writing were the perfect opportunity to demonstrate to your peers your grasp of taste and particularly your ability to criti cor correctly critique the landscape. Correspondence from the York Family Archives provides an insight into the activity of sharing travel experiences. This was written upon their return from Pembrokeshire in South Wales in 1776. We in short took the whole tour of Pembrokeshire and now I dare say, dear madame, you are possessing your, man, your mind with all possible patience and preparing yourself to read a long detail of journeys, visits, towns, castles, rocks and seas. But no, not one word shall you have till you come to Northampton for it. I promise you will not, shall not be bored to death. You will have a vast deal to say and a most violent inclination to be saying. And it would seem that poor Dr Syntax has fallen at this last hurdle and has indeed managed to bore his audience to death. The trials and tribulations of travel continued to ease throughout the 18th century and into the 19th, until listening to somebody recount their adventures was perhaps the most arduous part. Accessibility and improvement allowed more and more people of leisure to travel for tourism than ever before, and made the experience ever safer and more comfortable. One of the most staggering things about my research so far is the sheer quantity of unpublished domestic travel writing from this period, which exists within our country's county archives. This really is an untapped source, particularly for the landscape historian of this period. It also seems to have been inherently an inoccupation of the long 18th century. Once the spread of the railway network opened up domestic travel for a greater proportion of the population, domestic travel does not seem perhaps quite as adventurous, and there is a definite decline in the amateur travel writing being put together in the same way. But for those at the forefront of change and improvement in the 18th century, producing travel writing to share seems to have made the discomfort worthwhile. It seems, rather like posting all about your travels on Instagram today, was there any point in suffering all the trials and tribulations of travel if you don't get to tell anyone about it? Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Louise. That was fantastic. Um, just give you a few minutes to look at your breath. Uh, there we go. Um, so our second speaker is Jamil Palumbo. Oh, I should check that. Um, yes, I Jamil. am. Very well done, Danny. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll put that down to chance. And he is speaking on leaving Berlin, Jacob Burkhardt's Constantine as a farewell from Rank's historiography. So Jamil uh, is in his second year of a part-time literature PhD at the UEA. His research on the rejection of a scientific approach to humanities in Nietzsche and Burkhardt aims to deal with the, the problematization of histographical methods between the 18th and 20th centuries. Uh, you can find his handouts in the chat as both a PDF and Word documents. I'll stick that in again uh, if anyone's missed that. There we go. Uh, ready when you are. Right, I am. Thank you very much, Danny, for introducing me. And um, you can find me my handouts in the chat, as he said, to follow the little passages that I've taken from the constant time, which I'm going to discuss today. So if you want to follow me from close, please go there and um, download or just have a look at the PDF that I have uploaded to this chat. So um, the research project I'm developing aims to demonstrate a shared critical perspective on the application of a scientific method to humanities in Jakob Burkhardt and Friedrich Nietzsche, conducted through a comparison of the author's published and unpublished works. The research is also meant to look into the implications of this critical perspective. 
the aesthetic method of their later production will be depicted as a promising alternative to the stiff rules that they had learned during their scholarly apprenticeship in history as regard to Burkhardt and classic philology as regard to Nietzsche. More broadly, and not necessarily within the perimeter of this PhD dissertation, my research aims to deal with the question, as Danny said, of the relation between humanities and science at the dawn of contemporary age, but also, and more specifically, with the problematization of historiographical methods between the 18th and 20th centuries. Now, I've decided to devote this presentation to a specific work by one of the protagonists of my research, The Age of Constantine the Great, 1852, by Jakob Burkhardt. The reason of this choice lies in the fact that this eccentric piece of late Roman cultural history exemplifies the estrangement that my research aims to describe quite effectively. Furthermore, it is a relatively early work by Burkhardt and therefore is particularly emblematic of the distance he was starting to take from his mentor Leopold von Ranke. Regarding the latter, it's probably worth it to remind that he is largely considered as the founder of professional historiography and that this fame is usually connected to his notorious claim of objectivity of historical studies, or more commonly to his ambition expressed in the preface of the histories of the Romanic and Germanic peoples from 1824. So his ambition was to conceive of history as a research on what actually happened, the as eigentlich gewesen in German. If it's debatable whether the image of Ranke as father as well of master of modern historical histori historical scholarship, as Fritz Stern put it in the Varieties of History, should be accepted with no further doubts. It is nonetheless certain that he was Burkhardt's master and that the early development of the latter's theories and methods were therefore significantly influenced by this important figure. More precisely, in Burkhardt's imagination, Ranke remained the archetype of the vir eruditissimus in Latin, of an all too zealous scholar whose claims of objectivity were largely grounded on the meticulous examination of the tiniest details of past witnesses. Nevertheless, throughout his complex intellectual journey, Burkhardt remained quite loyal to two specific precepts of Rankian historiography, and more broadly, of historicist philosophy. The two concepts were the relevance of historical continuity and the capital, the crucial importance of the, the individuality. Now, choosing the subject of his first extended monograph, he realized that the late antiquity was the perfect case study to test his controversial understanding of these concepts. The individuality of the Emperor Constantine was to be considered as the main factor in a process that allowed the continuity of European history in its passage from pagan antiquity to the Christian Middle Ages. But the real meaning of this passage was not to be sought, as Ranke would have thought, in its significance within an uncannily providential Weltplan, the Germans would say, so a world plan, as it was in Hegel, more or less. Rather, Burkhardt granted much more freedom and self-determination to Constantine's intelligence and agency, revealing a reverence for the individual genius that went far beyond Ranke's boundaries. Consequently, he outlined the aforementioned continuity as a fortunate, possibly magical, but certainly not providential coincidence between this genius, Constantine, and the unique and repeatable historical circumstances in which he lived. Although a complete and exhaustive explanation of Burkhardt's methods occurred in his later works only, the strategies that adop adopted in the Constantine were already quite emblematic of his conception of historiography particularly of his use of sources. Thus, the work itself could be considered as a late symbolic farewell from what he had learned during his apprenticeship in Berlin, and notably from Ranke. The book, not by chance, the Constantine, was expressly dedicated to Ranke, his master. Now, a brisk look at the structure of the work and its content already reveals its peculiarities and distance from contemporary treatises on the late Roman Empire. The chronological account of the facts from Marcus Aurelius' death to the abdication of Diocletian occupy, occupies less than a sixth of the whole book, whereas the portrayal of, of Constantine and his regency is scattered across several chapters that deal with seemingly misleading things. Now, two chapters on the conditions on the provinces in which Burka tries mostly to describe the barbarian peoples before their Wanderungen 
are followed by two more sections on the religious scenario of the empire, a narrative of the senescence of ancient life and its culture, a brusque description of Christianity before and after Constantine, and finally, two chapters on the latter's edicts and policies. The heterogeneity of arguments was thus a first proof of the eccentricity of the work, but it was indeed the unbelievable variety of sources that the latter took into account that turned into, into a suggestive piece of cultural history. From painted portraits and price lists, to the most various sort of rhetorical and literary testimonies, to a cultural historian, and this is very important regarding to Burkhardt, everything is relevant everything can be considered as a source. And the young workers seem to embrace this feature of the discipline with great, with great ease and pleasure. However, the selection of literary sources for the work on the Dacian Emperor was particularly complex for the difficulty in the resolution of the interpretative problems derived not only from the questionable reliability of contemporary sources in general, mainly the canonical source for the case study, so the life of Constantine by Eusebius, was held by Burkhardt to be completely mendacious. Nonetheless, everything was relevant, as we said, and Eusebius could not be excluded either for the apologetic nature of his work or for his imprecision and biases in conveying the facts as they actually happened, especially if one considers that Burkhardt did include minor panegyrics, for example, among the sources. Rather, the awareness of his unreliability, of Eusebius' unreliability, entailed a totally different use of his testimony and consequently a totally different understanding of his value, of his weight in the overall balance of the research. Like many other historians before him, such, such as Edward Gibbon or his near contemporary Theodor Mommsen, Burkhardt could not deny that from a strictly scientific point of view, Eusebius' testimony was completely unserviceable. Nonetheless, its relevance for cultural history remained intact, as the portrait of the emperor that he offered ended up conveying a clear picture of the author of Eusebius, and consequently, a true account of the spirit of the age in which he had lived. The indisputable, inherent value of the Bishop of Caesarea, Eusebius, for a cultural history, lied in the fact that he was literally the first thoroughly dishonest historian of antiquity. Let's read Burkhardt. You can find it in the handouts, as we said. Eusebius is no fanatic. He understands Constantine's secular spirit and his cold and terrible lust for power well enough, and doubtless he knows the true causes of the war quite precisely. But he is the first thoroughly dishonest historian of antiquity. His tactic, which enjoyed a brilliant success in his own day and throughout the Middle Ages, consisted in making the first great protector of the church at all costs an ideal for, for humanity according to his lights, and above all, an ideal for future rulers. Hence, we have lost the picture of a genius in stature who knew no moral scruple in politics and regarded the religious question exclusively from the point of view of political expediency. Now, fortunately, the life of Constantine was not the only witness available. In the second book of Zosimus' new history, Historia Nea in Greek, because it was written in Greek, there was indeed an utterly different narrative of Constantine's conversion, which conveyed a rather different image of the great emperor. Let's go back to Burkhardt. Zosimus recounts the familiar hostile version. Because of the execution of Crispus and Fausta and the violation of his oath to Licinius, the emperor's conscience pricked him and he turned to pagan priests for absolution. When they told him that there was no expiation for such malefaction, an Egyptian who had come to Rome from Spain succeeded in making his way to the emperor through the ladies of the court and in convincing the emperor that Christianity was able to wash every misdeed away. The man described by the obscure pagan historian corresponded with great precision to the genius in stature who knew no moral scruple in politics whom Burkhard was trying to describe. His intimate tendency remained substantially unreligious, and his conversion had been purely formal, bloß äußerlich in German, as Burkhardt says. However, the fact that Zosimus had lived in the late 5th century did not diminish the value of his witness. Burkhardt used often to combine 
the most different and chronologically distant sources in order to support his intuitions. Thus, one should not be really surprised by his use of the satirist Lucian of Samo Zata, who had lived in the second century as a source for the description of the religious rituals of the eastern provinces. The witness of this frivolous Greek educated Syrian, as Burkhardt calls him, was to be taken into account, even though chronologically it did not belong to the historical period under examination. Unwillingly, and this is very important for Burkhardt in general, Lucian had revealed important elements of an attitude that had a precise role in the Middle Eastern reception of Christianity in the age of Constantine and beyond. There was, in synthesis, synthesizing, summarizing, there was no sort of document and testimony that could be excluded from an investigation about the spirit of an epoch. Lucian's grotesque exaggeration, but also use views, blatant falsifications, had to be read with extreme caution and a fair pinch of critical sobriety. But in the complex balance of workers' cultural history, their relevance was ultimately not debatable. Along similar lines, his omnivorous curiosity went so far as to consider the tales of Christians' martyrdoms, not just for their inner, inherent interest and relevance, but because they offered literally a historical spectacle of the greatest magnitude. A tragedy, I would like to say, that could never have been excluded from his Kulturgeschichte, from his cultural history of the late Roman Empire. Let's go back to Burkhardt. Church history has long regarded it a sacred duty to preserve the memory of the noblest and most edifying of the martyrdoms of the period. We must be content to refer to Eusebius and the collection of legends for details. Despite the exception which historical criticism may justly take to individual circumstances and especially to the miracles which have become attached to them, the sight of this new society with its new religion and philosophy struggling against the most powerful of all states with its paganism and its millennium old culture and eventually prevailing by its very suppression, it's nevertheless, as we said, a historical spectacle of the greatest magnitude. Now, the fact that Burkhardt's choice to include these testimonies in his analysis was grounded on their capacity to offer a magnificent spectacle on their aesthetic significance, on their aesthetic value, seems to confirm our insights on the artistic nature of his historiography, and it allows me to hint briefly at the main comparison of my research. In a philosophical debate dominated on one hand by the systematic ambitions of the Hegelians, and on the other hand, by the specialistic zeal of a historical theory that was slowly and dangerously proceeding towards an assimilation by natural sciences, Burka started to hint at an autonomy of the aesthetic element, thus aesthetische in German or l'estetico in Italian, that needed to wait for the early works by Friedrich Nietzsche, indeed, to receive an exhaustive philosophical formulation. However, Another remarkably complex question of the late Romanity concerned the regency of Diocletian, an emperor highly valued by Burkhardt for his political farsightedness. Diocletian himself, Burkhardt writes, can offer no defense. His edicts have perished, and his secret designs may have been the exact opposite of those imagined. The possibility of finding the official edicts was the main problem, but not the only one. Unlike Constantine, the Dalmatian emperor had no apologies to defend him whatsoever. Pagan historians of the age, like Ammianus Marcellinus, seem to have completely avoided the narrative of his strict and cruel religious policies, and therefore, the reconstruction of his figure was necessarily tied to the characterization of the Christian sources. The Christians heap the name of Diocletian with curses, Burkhardt writes and neither could pagan or Greek or Roman education favor him because he introduced Orientalism into political and social life. The only historians who might possibly present a true nexus of events, Ammianus and Zosimus, are mangled, and perhaps for the very reason that they treated Diocletian fairly. In the general lack of sources connected by Burkhardt, he was cheeky on this, connected by Burkhardt to the guilty censorship of church historiography, the only possible reference was of the deaths of per persecutors by Lactantius, a work of great intensity and erudition that had nonetheless the significant lim limitation of being a partisan document because Lactantius was Christian. 
Hence, it was extremely difficult to find sources that could redeem Diocletian's political agency. The spirit of the age seemed partial to recognize him symbolically as the last great enemy of the approaching future. Neglecting or at least minimizing crucial policies such as the introduction of the Tetrarchy and the reform of, and the reform of currency. Despite this unfortunate legacy, Burkhardt always deemed him the wise statesman who, in the widespread tumult, had tried to contain the impressive religious and cultural revolution approaching, whereas Constantine remained the egoist robed in purple. A clever regent who, in the same tumult, had prioritized his personal ambition and thirst for power. Indeed, many years had gone by since the young Jacob had left Berlin and his tumultuous cluster of partisan narratives, and he had become particularly proficient in the disclosure of personal power dynamics. Burkhardt used to articulate the, the narrative of political power and its holders along two closely intertwined lines. The great political individualities of the past were immediately recognized and analyzed in their humanity and he tried to depict their personality by elaborating different sources about their character and life vicissitudes. Consequently, he kept the narrative as far as possible from conceptual abstractions and metaphysical characterization as much as from celebratory tones. In a rejection of the standards of political historiography, romantic historiography, for, for example, that could not have been more resolute. Nevertheless, his ultimate estrangement from Ranke was visible not only in these choices, but also and mainly in the fact that his scepticism towards Hegel and philosophy and his critical spirit did not imply a radicalization of the scientific purposes of historical research. As we have seen, already in his first accomplished work, there was not much left of the concept of history as an account of things as they actually happened, as Ranke wanted it to be. Unless we reconsider the meaning of the word actually, interpreting it according to a concept of truth that could not be further removed from Ranke's idea of objectivity, and that, as I shall hopefully confirm in the next stages of my research, needed just a few more diggers to be properly expressed and, from, and just to appear. Thank you very much. There we go. Uh, well, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Thank you, Jamil. So, yes. Thank uh, you, Dan. Give you a few moments to calm down there. Uh, from that, some really intense history. Um, so, as I said to all of you at the start, you can either put up your digital hands, which should be in the little bar, the little grey bar in front of Teams, wherever it exists. I, I, I can't promise it's specific. Uh, as Will has done, or you can include your question in the chat box. Um, again, I'm happy to respond to whichever or yes. But then we first of all we've got Will. Um, Will, if you'd like to unmute and give us your question. Hello. Yeah. Thanks both for uh, excellent papers. Um, my question is for Louise, and I just wanted to know that uh, who actually ran the kind of stagecoach system. Was it like an 18th century network rail or were there like a series of smaller operators? How did it function? Uh, yeah, so th this is, they would have been sort of private individuals. Uh, they're run as sort of private businesses. Um, and as the 18th century goes on, you, you see these stagecoach firms grow because demand grows so enormously. Um, so there's, there's a fantastic book by uh, Dorian Gerhold um, who looks at sort of the expansion of these stagecoach companies um, and that they are they sort of do start up as one man with his coach I, I'm not aware of any sort of national rail kind of um, uh, regional kind of provision they're definitely it's not like public transport today would be that they're advertised so you can get on to a stagecoach at a set time uh, as a member of the public but it, it's definitely not the same thing as public transport that we would recognise in the modern era. So. Yeah. Although they sound slightly more reliable than first bus in Norwich. so Possibly, if you're willing to wait, it might be a day either side. But <laughs> That's what I have to do anyway. <laughs> Thanks. Danny, you're on mute. Oh, I was, uh, yes. Uh, it's an well, easy mistake to make. Don't worry about it. Uh, Orin, uh, if you'd like to 
ask your question. I'd love to hear it. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you both for 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 that. Um, I um, I'm a uh, I'm a real Burkhardt enthusiast, and so I'm uh, I was uh, delighted to and 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 an enthusiast of the Constantine too, which is uh, uh, much overlooked by many of my of many of my tribe of uh, Renaissance uh, scholars. Um, I was just wondering, in listening to you talk about uh, Burkhardt's method uh, with that, I, um, I mean, may maybe this is what you were alluding to that you were going to go on to later in comparing uh, this work with one of his, uh, with, with his later works, including the, uh, you know, uh, Die Culture de Renaissance uh, in Italian. Um, I'm thinking about, you know, from Hayden White as well too, thinking about Burkhardt and irony. And, uh, you know, whether you see there being a storyline uh, beyond just um, the uh, experimentation with a new type of historical writing, beyond this kind of response to Ranke and doing something else, whether you agree, uh, essentially, that actually this entire, this, uh, the treatment of Diocletian, uh, the treatment of those transitional figures are Lactantius's and, and Eusebius's of this story is, uh, do you agree that we have this ironic story here? Is that also your interpretation, like it was for Hayden White, and then, uh, for example, that uh, that what Burkhardt is doing here is setting up the, an irony, uh, that actually Diocletian's reforms are what uh, paved the way for Constantine being able to, uh, the work of Constantine and Eusebius and so on in overhauling the religion of the empire. And yet Constantine's overhaul of religion is what allows for the survival of pagan culture, uh, just in the new form of Christianity. Uh, uh, I mean, th that ironic structure there, right? That, that Diocletian does these reforms that allow Constantine to do this, which is what allows classical civilization to survive uh, and uh, be taken on board by the barbarians uh, through the church. Do you agree or is that not a way that you see this work working? Mm, thank you for your question. It is really, really appropriate and pertinent. I think um, the irony has a massive role in Burkhardt in general, in Burkhardt's historiography in general, but I would not necessarily connect this idea of irony to his depiction of Diocletian. As I said, if you go back to the Constantine and read the Constantine, you have the real feeling that he uh, tries to reduce Theme Diocletian in all in every way. Yeah, I, I think that the, the continuity that he, that he wants to to portray the here in this book he, in his early work on the Constantine is is the continuity of European culture as a whole, not really of pa paganism. He really believes that paganism died with Diocletian yeah, okay, yeah, died. Yeah with the conversion of Constantine and so on. So um, he's certainly a very ironic uh, author, but he's probably more ironic in a, let's say, um, Socratic, Socratical, you know, meaning of the word. So he tends to, um, to let, let's say, put in brackets, let, let me this, this Italianism, to put into brackets some things to have a clear picture of the things he's after, you know, he's looking into. And um, and so, yes, for example, you you refer to the civilization of the Renaissance. I really think that there is a lot of continuity in these two works because the Renaissance was as well another period where the continuity of European culture was tested, was um, was paying a heavy toll to go on. OK, and so Burkhardt was particularly uh, interested in these periods. And this was because of his irony, because um, the the irony that he was able to express in his uh, in his writings, but also in his lectures, because we know that Burkhardt was mainly a professor. He didn't write a lot. He didn't want to publish a lot in written form. He wanted to express verbally to his students his lectures, his ideas and thoughts and knowledges and so on. So, um, for example, the, the, the Civilization of the Renaissance is the last published book. 1860, so just eight, seven years after the Constantine. So the style is pretty much the same. And the main question is, 
pretty much the same. Point is, those two ages, those two epochs are ironic ages, mm -hmm. uh, ages of destruction of what there was before in the way Socrates used to destruct, you know, to de destroy what the opinion of his, mm -hmm. you know, interlocutor. So um, I would say, yes, irony and Burkhardt is a very, very, you know, <laughs> interesting theme. And I think there's much study to do on it, especially related to Nietzsche, because Nietzsche was another ironist, mm -hmm. strong irony. Yeah, okay. I hope I, I've answered your question. Yes, I mean, I, it's just, I, I, I mean, I, 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 I think I agree with you there that the, um, that not that the treatment of Diocletian himself is, um, is, is ironic, but rather uh, that, the, that the moment, you know, and I, that's why I'm wondering, you know, the story that he's telling, and I think you're, this is what you're saying here, is one where there is, uh, that this period is ironic and that there's an ironic uh, there's, a, there's an irony to his story that he has of this rather than a progressive story there's an ironic story perhaps that's coming through here and yes. that's um and yeah and um yeah thank you that was that was and uh, uh, thanks for the answer too again thank you very much for that um will did you have a second question yes i have a follow-up question for louise if that's all right yeah. My, my second question, it's actually two questions, so it'll be my second and third questions, uh, would be, is have you looked at how the road infrastructure and the quality of the roads compared to, say, France or Italy, for example? Because my girlfriend is Spanish and she's always comparing and complaining about the quality of English roads. And this follow on to that question would be, was there or have you seen in your research on uh, domestic travel, the tendency to compare with foreign travel. I know there was one quote you hinted at which did kind of do that, and I wondered if there was any more, or if it's just kind of a modern fascination to compare. Yeah, so I definitely, um, so 18th century travel, I think most people, when we think about it, think of the Grand Tour in Europe. Um, and there is a definite sense that, um, so the grand the grand tourists sort of go off, and that there are they are the same group that travel domestically in Britain. It's a strange overlap, but a much wider group travels in this country. Um, and from what I've I have looked into grand tourism, not quite as in depth because my research is mostly on British travel. Um, comment on roads is much much more widely recorded on British roads. So if that it and it tends to be only if the road surface is particularly bad or particularly good. So we don't get much of this sort of mid-ground type of thing. Um, you can generally tell if a, a particular region has really poor road surfaces because it will be commented on continually. If there is no mention of the road surface, it's probably OK. <laughs> um, and it definitely seems, from what I can tell, that Britain doesn't have brilliant roads for most of this period. Um, the comparison with Europe is difficult. It doesn't come up that often in European travel writing that I've read which would suggest that they're not probably as problematic, but they, they have different things to contend with. So, I mean, you have travellers trying to get their coaches up the side of Mount Vesuvius and other <laughs> things that you don't come across in Britain. Um, and also the way in which travel in Europe is sort of uh, conducted is kind of similar in that they sort of encourage that you should probably take your own carriage is probably the easiest way to do it. And you're in charge of your own sort of timetable and um, there's a kind of safety implied in going under your own steam um and there is sort of there is there is definitely comparisons made continually actually between travel in europe and travel in britain but mostly for in terms of the way in which they look at the scenery that they see in britain um but it goes vice versa as well so there's a, a fantastic i didn't include it uh where there's a traveler in the south of france who spent most of the last year i think in europe and he complains that actually where, what he's seen in Europe, you could see quite happily in northern Wales and north of England. And he'd be much happier there. It'd be much less inconvenient. <laughs> um, so the, the comparisons are made. And it is, I think, because there is still the strong sense of travel in the 18th century is still the grand tour in Europe. Even amongst those who are traveling in Britain, they're kind of in the back of their mind are constantly comparing to either experiences they've had or other experiences they've read. Um, 
Yeah, I, I couldn't definitely comment on the, the surface of the roads in Spain, so <laughs> that's all right. Cheers, thank you. Um, are there more questions from the audience? Because if not, I might take the luxury of asking one of my own. Okay, oh, if that's all right then. Louise, uh, I think there's mention of the construction of military roads, at least in Scotland, to help facilitate the crushing of the Jacobites. Is is there, again, any further road construction? Is, again, is this helping to improve the infrastructure as part of this process? Yeah, so the, the road building programmes that happen in Scotland um, are kind of the, the thing that brings the tourism into Scotland, if you like. Um, before this point, Scotland is sort of, I think it, it's deemed kind of not necessarily dangerous in the way that we might sense it, but it is kind of an unknown. Um, and the northern Scotland in particular really isn't ventured into really until the Victorian period. It's, it's amazingly late how the highlands are actually become quite sort of notable destinations for tourism. Um, and they, they say that sort of, you know, the, the Scots in the, the border counties are, still, are more unknown. So, um, so yeah, the, the building of military roads, it's something I haven't gone into a great amount of detail, um, but there's uh, there's a fantastic book called uh, Terra Incognita, um, which discusses sort of road building in Scotland and how that brought travel up into Scotland. Um, it's It's a strange thing because it's not something we see in the rest of the country, obviously. So to sort of say, it's, it's a hard one to draw comparisons with to see how accessible it makes the area. It's certainly for control of the area um, and for safety, if we can put it like that, um, it, it would, yeah, it makes a big difference. Absolutely brilliant. So I'll do one final check for questions. Uh, make sure the chat's clear. It's all good. Uh, well, again, um, once, of all, once more, again, if you want to show your appreciation, uh, to Louise and Jamil for two fantastic talks. Uh, I'm really glad for them to give her their time. Uh, we should be meeting again in two weeks, uh, same time, same day, um, to discuss the Great Seal and witchcraft with a Jack Sargent and Oscar Joyce, respectively. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, so again, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Excuse me. Hey. Me. I have, as a partially historian, not really a historian, as a, let's say, philosopher of history, I have a question for you historians here involved in this seminar. You can take your time to answer me, you can send me written, you know, <laughs> notes or thoughts about it, but my question would be, actually, what do you think of the current situation of historians you know, scientific methods. For, for example, Louise has, uh, has done many references to like data, ancient data, okay? So collection of data we, which come from those centuries, so the 18th, the 17th centuries and so on. So, uh, but also she has made references to the, to some, you know, impressions, feelings of the people, you know, testimonies of people of that age. So she's something, she's doing something in between of, you know, a, a cultural history. So on the people and, you know, a scientific chron chronological history, you know, old fashioned history. So what do you think the balance would be nowadays for a modern, for a contemporary historian, the balance be between, let's say, rigor and fantasy? As Burkhardt once said, for, for example, in, in a letter, what's the balance nowadays between fantasy, invention and um, zeal? Uh, <laughs> it, it's an incredibly difficult balance. And you've highlighted that actually with my, so my research that I, I have been doing, it does combine like, I don't even know if I want to call it scientific data analysis, um, but I do, part of what I've been looking at is frequency of word use in travel writing um particular words that you know descriptive adjectives that describe different types of landscape um there have been other projects which have attempted to plot these words onto types of landscape so actually map it to try and map language onto the landscape um which is obviously sort of involves uh we have geographic information systems and mapping systems and that's data collection and i can graph you know i can graph the travel writing in terms of the incidences of language um, but I also, because I do emotion, a lot of what I'm looking at is emotional interpretation of land perspective on landscape, which is 
as you say, it's quite an individual thing. I'm sure I would respond to something very differently to say you if you read it or so that that is a it's a difficult thing to overcome because I think we all have very different ways of interpreting things. Um, and there's there's also, I mean, within the field that I study, um, phenomenology is something that's quite uh, criticized as or it's, it can be quite criticized because it doesn't seem to have a solid methodology mythology to it. <laughs> um, which is, again, where, where do you draw that line? How do you balance between what I personally interpret a source and then how how my my reader would interpret it? It is incredibly difficult. Um, but I think it's also, I'm not sure you can write, as you say, just kind of chronologically anymore. I feel like it's it's not um, not necessarily acceptable, but it's, it's not a well-rounded enough approach just to write a chronological history. You have to have these different inputs it's it's very difficult um I think do you come from a is it a are you in the languages department or where where have you like what is your background into this I I come from philosophy I've studied philosophy right. both from MBA and MA so I have I am really into the problematization of things but not really into things maybe that's why I have no solid foundation as you said <laughs> <laughs> It, it is so difficult. I think that was one of the things in applying for a PhD was uh, what other avenues can you bring into this is you have to consider all these other angles and to have the kind of um, interdisciplinary kind of as it makes for a stronger work now. And I think it's almost unavoidable, actually. Um, yeah, I don't know what you guys think. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for your answer. Thank you all for attending. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> are we on our do you own? want to put do you want to be the presenter next week then uh Jamil? <laughs> you can take over i mean we'll let's sit back now i'm retiring <laughs> well i'm going to end the recording here because i think with that extra bonus content our audience is going to love this on youtube but again thank you both um and again thank you will for making it after what was obviously quite a tough day of it and yeah i'd uh, join us the same bat time, same bat channel. Thank you. Yeah.